Hello, I'm Justin Smith, and this is day five of Listen Now Week. Please follow the hashtag, please share these videos with people you think uh, need to see them. This week is dedicated to having an open and honest conversation around mental health, and particularly around suicide. James McLeod, who's the Managing Director of Tobin Brothers Funerals, has put this together, and the reason that they have done it is they are just burying so many people because of suicide, and we just need to change that conversation. I think it goes without saying, too, that, that with the suicide of a younger person, it seems to carry its own kind of sadness and its, its own kind of pain. There's something particularly tragic about a younger person taking their life. Adolescent psychologist Michael Carr Gregg uh, is a great guy and a friend of mine and he has been uh, working in this area for many, many years and dealing with many young people. Michael, thanks for the chat. Good to see you, mate. Pleasure. In this world of isolation, which I guess doesn't help for a lot of people, does it? No, in fact, um, one, one of the things that we know very clearly from psychological research is that a combination of financial hardship and uh, physical isolation is just terrible for yeah. your mental health, which is why the experts are saying we're sort of in danger of creating this perfect storm for mental health problems. Have you seen, I mean, and, and no detail, obviously, but have you with, you, with clients that you've been seeing, have you noticed the difference with the isolation? Oh, there's no question. Um, if you think about the developmental psychology of young people, and I know you've got uh, young people of your own, um, there are four things that they need to be doing. One is to emancipate from the adult carers, form uh, wonderful relationships with pro-social peers, acquire the skills for future economic independence, and of course, figure out who they are um, by taking sort of healthy risks. If you think about those four key developmental tasks, they're all thwarted by this type of lockdown. So not good. No. With suicide, Michael, I mean, we want to have a chat to you mainly about adolescent uh, uh, mental health and, and suicide. But how, do you, how have you seen the conversation around suicide in the last few years? I mean, it has changed. But in your opinion, has it, has it really changed enough? Oh, look, no, I don't think it has changed enough. Uh, m my narrative on this has been very simple and very consistent for all the years that you, have no you and I have known each other. Yeah. And that is that the vast majority of young people end their life because they have a mental health problem. The most common mental health problem is depression. Now, that's not just me saying it. The greatest suicidologist that's ever lived in Christchurch, New Zealand, Annette Beautres, has said this consistently. And therefore, if we're going to have a sensible conversation about suicide prevention, we really have to have a conversation about depression. And one of the litmus tests for this is if I was having um, a, a convivial meal with you and your family, I would ask the young people a simple question. Do you know the difference between sadness and depression. And sadly, um, despite all of the um, public health campaigns, I fear, Justin, that there are far too many people who can't make that distinction. Got it. Got it. So, so the parents having an understanding, uh, the teens having an understanding, and also their friends having an understanding of that. So we all get to know each other a little bit better, and we all get to recognise that a little bit better. But also, as you're saying, recognising it within yourself. Well, depression is treatable um, and it's most treatable if we have early diagnosis and early um, evidence-based intervention. And sadly, that's not happening. About 35% of the people who uh, have depression across Australia, um, in fact, uh, get treatment. And that leaves an awful lot of people who don't. Michael, I know, I know that you have been at the, the awful end of this, but... Um... There are a few things I would imagine that are as tragic as a teen suicide um, on the families, on their friends, and, and obviously on the, on the person. I, I just I think, how do you get your head around something like that? I think it's the equivalent of an emotional nuclear bomb going off. And the 
um, psychological fallout uh, lasts um, not just minutes, hours and days, but years. And um, I think it is still shrouded with so much shame that it really is something that a lot of people push underground. They're um, really quite, quite ashamed of what has happened. I had a yeah. conversation with a friend of mine yesterday and this is the, yesterday was the anniversary of their brother's suicide. And they were telling me that they still do not speak of it within the family. And that was 20 years ago. So they, they don't talk, you know, if somebody were to die of cancer or they die in a car crash or, you know, those, the way that we've talked about those things have really changed, but suicide, we still, but that doesn't help, does it? I mean, it, it doesn't help anybody. To, to not discuss it openly. So how do we do that? I mean, how do we change? For me, you know, as a journalist working in the media, how do I change? But how do families change? How do, how do society change? Well, the difficulty we face is that we know that if we report a suicide in all the gory details, the when, the where, and the how, we know from multiple pieces of research that that has a very significant evidence-based likelihood of increasing the overall prevalence. And I know that you wouldn't want that. And I know that um, most of the responsible journalists around Australia wouldn't want that. So it really is a matter of following the guidelines that have been laid down by the Mindframe organisation, where you can acknowledge that somebody did in fact take their own life. Um, and in many instances, um, they do mention the fact that there was a history of mental illness and I think then go on to discuss mental illness, but not to dwell on the minutiae of um, how, where and why the person who ended no, their haven't. life did so. But we still, you know, I mean, you, you would read a newspaper article. I mean, does this need to change? You read a newspaper article and, you know, it says that somebody died and then doesn't say how or what it, and right at the bottom it's got the beyond blue number or the lifeline number and you've almost got to put those two things together you know you've almost got to play a little Sherlock Holmes sometimes and work out a couple of things that people have said in the article where they said there were he died alone there were non-suspicious circumstances you know and you piece it together before you hit you know you go ah suicide do we need to change that and and use the s word in there or or, or is that not helpful um, my view is that the jury is still out from an evidence base. There certainly does seem to be clear evidence that if you do go into detail, you increase the rate. The most startling example of that was in Vienna in the 70s when a group of psychologists went to the newspaper editors and said, could you please stop reporting the particular deaths that occurred in the underground there? And when they did stop reporting it for six months, the rate dropped by 50%. So I think that the connection is clear. The balance that we have to strike, and I don't think we've found it yet, and you're quite right, is between stopping this nonsense code that the journalists kind of enter into and actually say, no, this person committed suicide. You know, we did it with Michael Hutchins um, and we tend to do it with celebrities, but we don't seem to do it with other people. people. Mm, yeah, there's that disconnect there, isn't it? It's almost though celebrities aren't the real people and they weren't going through the same kind of problems. Actually, speaking of celebrities, though, because I, mean, I think this is a thing that you see somebody who's famous, you look at a Michael Hutchins, for example, I mean, and, and you, you say, look, this, and we've had a, a, a real slew of, of, of tragic suicides of celebrities. We look at them and think, look, they've got it all. They've got the money, they've got, they've got everything you need to lead a good life. What the hell happened? I guess that's a... Yeah, I a question that, get, that their families would be asking forever is what the hell happened? A, a more intelligent um, and nuanced way of reporting that, and it's the sort of stuff that you do, which is why I love your writing, oh, is you, that you would acknowledge that Michael Hutchinson and the, the two people that we're thinking of who just took their own lives recently, um, all of them had proven mental health problems, all of them had family issues, and all of them had substance abuse disorder. So you had the sort of 
unholy trinity, which yeah. you see time and time again as major risk factors for uh, suicide. So that's what I think we should report and then have an examination of what we can do to stop that stuff. I mean, one of the things that I've been banging on um, for years about is funding the actual mental health care system properly. And we were about to have a mental health care tax in Victoria, which I welcomed. Um, but of course, COVID upset that. Yeah. And the other issue is I, I've said to you on multiple occasions, I think we should have a uh, alcohol tax, hypothecated al alcohol tax that goes directly into funding suicide prevention programs and really put decent money into it instead of the hodgepodge stuff that we've got at the moment. So targeting suicide as something, instead of, in, and putting it almost in its own category. Uh, so we're looking at mental health, we're looking at uh, anxiety, we're looking at eating disorders, but we're also specifically targeting people that are thinking of taking their own life in, in suicide. I think, we have to, I think we have to target the risk factors in particular. Um, you know, the drug and alcohol area is appallingly funded. That's such a key factor. Um, there was a study that was done on young people in New York City a few years ago where they uh, did physical autopsies on 129 young people who had taken their own lives. Every single one of them had quite high levels of alcohol in their system. And alcohol is a disinhibitor. We know that, you know, that's a, a key factor, as is the illicit drugs, which seem to now almost be, um, you know, fobbed off as, oh, it's just a phase that they're going through. No, it's a real risk factor and increases the risk of suicide. Michael, last thing is you are, you're, you're in your office and you're talking with a 16-year-old a and they're, they're in a dark place. And, well, firstly, do they admit to you that they've thought about hurting themselves and taking their own life? And secondly, if they do, what is your approach? Well, the answer to the first question is no. Um, mental health first aid is all about asking the question directly, having the courageous conversation. Are you thinking of killing yourself? That is the question. And a lot of people are frightened of asking that question because they're worried they'll put the thought in their head, which is um, an understandable assumption, but it has no evidence. Um, so if I ask that question and they say yes, then I follow up with questions like, have you got a plan? Is there a date by which time, if things don't change, you're going to do this? Have you um, uh, decided already to do this? And um, then obviously I put in place a, a safety plan. I tell the um, adult carers of these young people because that's my job. And I do absolutely everything I can to keep them safe. Um, might mean that they have to go on medication it might mean that they have to go into hospital for a while, but I will do everything I can to keep them alive. Well, it's a big fight, isn't it? It's a big fight. And what's happening right now with our isolation is not, it ain't helping, is it, at all? No, um, but I'm also, I've just finished a, a webinar with the Victorian Department of Education where we talked about um, the despair that many of the year 11 and 12 students are feeling at the moment. And we had quite a few on the webinar. Um, so we had their voice and I'm actually saying, no, this isn't inevitable. This is actually an opportunity for us to focus on well-being, sleep, diet, exercise, and actually um, preventative mental health. So I see um, the glass not as half empty, but half full and uh, I think more and more people are coming around to seeing this as an opportunity rather than a catastrophe. I think that is a great way of looking at it. Mate, it's so good to see you again. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure.